You're the boss. Okay, thanks everybody for joining us today. Dr. Melissa Cast Brady is here from the University of Nebraska at Omaha to share with us a little bit about the importance of adults at play and how libraries can help. So thank you, Melissa, for being here today. Oh, thank you. Um, this has been a fun topic for me. And every so often it comes back and, and life teaches me again and again how important play is. And I think libraries can play a really, I'm gonna use that word a lot, have an important role in helping adults with play. So we always think about it with kids, but it's, it's important for adults as well. And sometimes we forget that. So I just, before we get too far into this though, you, you've probably seen a poll on your screen. You should see a poll listed on your screen. If you haven't already done so, if you go to menti.com and enter that code there, it should bring up a poll. And just reflect on yourself as a person who plays. And when you get the chance, I know we're all busy, but when you get the chance, what is your personality as a player? Are you a joker? You know, are you an explorer? An explorer, we always think is maybe means traveling, but it also can be exploring ideas. You know, genealogists, I often think of as explorers. Directors, those are those people who organize and love and, and love to organize. They're the ones putting together the block parties and stuff like that. That's their play. The kinesthet obviously needs to move. Then we have the competitor who doesn't necessarily need to compete with other people. Sometimes they're content just to one up themselves. Collectors, we're not talking about hoarders. <laughs> Collectors are folks who really, um, when they're collecting, they're looking for that unique that find that fits that niche within what they have or add something special. Um, so they're, they're, you know, it's kind of like in a way they're in a hunt. And then there's the storytellers, which I think we know very well in our libraries. And we often feel like we're in that role of facilitating that storytelling and stuff like that. So I will go ahead and get started here if I can get my slides to move. There we go. So. Introduce myself again. I'm Melissa Casbridi. I teach at the University of Nebraska Omaha in our undergraduate library science program. And I just started getting a buzz. Are you getting that? Is it okay? You're good? Okay. So this is my hope for today that we have an idea of, of what play is, what it means for adults, and some of the ways that libraries are already doing it. I think many of us are doing it, just recognizing it so we can realize how important those activities are and that we can share that information with our stakeholders. But before we do that, we can't talk about play without playing. So we're going to have a scavenger hunt. We'll see how it works with, we've got 38 people here. We'll see how this works. So throughout this presentation, I will different times stop and just ask you to look around your environment. Hopefully you don't have to go too far and see who has the object that I'm asking for on the screen. All right, so start off. First one, who has a purple pen? Ah, Tammy. Just looking, I can't see everybody here. Anybody else have a purple pen? Tammy and Katie at Verdigree. I might need somebody else to keep track of everybody to see who we have. So we have lots of purple, oh, we've got tons of purple pins out there. Awesome. This came to me because I have one on my desk. So why do we need to do this play? Why do we need to interact in, in, in a playful way? How many people have seen The Shining? I have to admit, I cannot sit through it. I have not seen the whole thing, but I'm very familiar with this scene where the typewriter keeps typing over and over again, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy over and over and over again. This is not a, you know, a new thing. This phrase has been around since the 17th century. So we as humans have known for a long time that play is important. It's just sometimes we forget about it. I became more familiar with 
the importance of play through the work of Stuart Brown. When I, I heard about him several years ago, actually at a youth retreat, um, someone came and talked about Stuart Brown's work. And Stuart Brown is a clinical psychologist and psychiatrist. And he came to this through a very tragic event. I don't know how many people remember in, I believe it was the late 60s, the Texas Tower shooting. It was one of the country's first um, mass shootings that really hit the media and the media really heard about it. It was, it was very tragic. Um, as a result of that, the governor, the then governor of the state of Texas put together a team to investigate, you know, why did this happen? We don't want this happening again. And so figuring out what the common element was here so we can prevent this. We can find folks who may have this, um, be at risk for this and, and stop them. And, you know, there was, it was like very little. The only thing the task force could come up with was that the shooter was deprived of play. It was a deprivation of play. And that just stuck with, stuck, stuck with Brown. And he started researching and interviewing with violent criminals. So not a happy, happy thing. And he just consistently, through all these criminals, the one common thread he found was the lack of play in their lives, you know, from childhood and in adulthood, that, you know, life was either so structured or there was just no opportunities for play in their lives. And so we're not going to make a big leap and say we can solve the world problems and everything through play, but it's significant that it does play such a huge role in our, our development as children, but also our continued development as adults. So you, normally you put your resources at the end, but these are two that I think are really useful and easily accessible. You can get into them and really um, not get bogged down in the weeds. Um, Stuart Brown's book is called Play, so nice and simple, but there's also the Nas National Institutes of Play, which he works with. They have a lot of resources online. Oh, scavenger hunt. Who has a dictionary handy? Or do all you folks just look stuff up online now? Dictionaries. Oh, Robin has a dictionary. Heather has a dictionary. Everybody else has their screens off. Robin, Heather. Katie has a dictionary. Oh, Katie has a dictionary. Katie has a dictionary. Okay. Cool. I do not have a dictionary. I will admit. I have like several at home. Not in none, none in my office. I need to do that. So there research, when you look at research, three things really stand out in terms of play and what we gain from play. Intelligence helps with our understanding of the world and you know the world is changing. So this really helps us deal with that and see how that goes. So first, intelligence. I love this line from Brown, play is learning's partner. That's because we can't learn without accessing some form of memory. We are building on background knowledge, even in math, we are building on our learning of counting and counting we're learning basing on our memory of you know all kinds of things so we're, we're using memory constantly when we're learning memory works best when we're paying attention and attention kicks in when there's some kind of emotion or reward involved with it so that's play so that's a big part of what play and helps with our memory which Engages with our engages our learning, and I think we've all probably heard the research behind crossword puzzles and doing Sudoku and that on cognitive function and that sort of thing. I really like the item in that third bullet point about video games. I need to start playing video games. What I really loved about that is you see that actually that cognitive improvement lasted for six months. 
which for which is significant, six months of that. And so if you do it continually, think how that could exponentially increase. What I really love about this study was, is that they saw this improvement was higher. There was greater improvement in older folks like me than there were the 20 somethings. And so it shows really great that, you know, hope for some of us out there in the world. Speaking of the world, Research also shows that game playing helps us understand that there's not just our way of doing things, that when we interact and play with people, we see their strategies and how they do things and that those strategies are working. And so maybe not necessarily our way is always the best way. And maybe there isn't a best way, but there are different ways that all work and help us accept that and not get you know, locked and rigid into our, our thinking of how things have to be done. It can also help us with that environmental situational understanding of, of our world and working with others. And research has shown that when we play, you know, all those things that look kind of hokey to us, those team bonding exercises and things like that, that play can really help us build relationships. We start trusting each other. So if you do all that and do that, relationship building before you get into a situation where you have to do an intense collaborative project, that trust and those connections have already been built. So like if you're out there throwing mud at each other and suddenly have to come in and do a serious project, you've seen this person at you know their muddiest and they've seen you at their muddiest, your muddiest, and they were okay with you still. So you can be more relaxed and not worry about all those other things going on and really focus on the task and work together because you've already played together. It can also help us with life change. Changes are growing on constantly as well as, as we transition from different stages in our life. So we think about groups like the Red Hat Society doing that. But even simple things like card groups, regular card groups get together. Because if you think about it, what's happening while they're playing these cards? They're chit-chatting, they're talking. They're talking about, oh, you know, my aches and pains, my trying this. And somebody else will say, well, you know, my sister-in-law tried that and it didn't work for her. But my cousin did this thing and it was fabulous. So we start learning how to strat strategies for dealing with some of these life transitions because we're chit-chatting about them. We also realize we're not the only ones. We're not alone in this feeling this as we chit-chat. And we're doing this having these conversations because we're relaxed and we're distracted by these game playings and it just comes up and we're developing that trust. So we're able to talk about things that maybe in general, we can sit down and just have a talk about. So when we talk about play, a lot of people associate it with leisure. If we look at the statistics for leisure, this is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It looks like here, that we're doing a good job. Four, you know, even the smallest bar is showing four hours a day on leisure. So that sounds like we're doing pretty good. But if we look at what that is, of that leisure, 75% of it is television. And 17% is socializing. Now, socializing is a big part of play. So play could be happening in there. It could also be. Facebook and those things, and are those necessarily play? I think the jury's still out on that, but television is something to really look at. In 2018, on average, Americans watched almost three hours of television a day across the board. I'm guessing in the last two years with everything that's going on, it's probably a bit higher now. And that's a lot of television. If we think about play, research says TV doesn't count as play. Unless you, it's a comedy because you really need a good laugh. Like, if you haven't done that in a while, then it can be playful. But television doesn't count because if you think about it, with television, you're just sitting there, your interaction stops. You're absorbed in television. You're not necessarily interacting much. You become inactive. Just sitting there watching. 
the storyline, this is very important. The storyline is set by someone else. Someone else is choosing what the characters look like. Someone else is choosing how a line is set. Like when we read a book, we choose how we think that line is set. We're, even though we have a description of what the person looks like, we're all each coming up with a different image in our head. We have a different idea of what the setting looks like and the house where people live and things like that. We create these things on our own. Television does all of that for us. So we're not doing that. In thinking about this, Brown presents this idea, of this metaphor of a sea squirt. The sea squirts are these critters that obviously live in the sea, oceans, and they attach themselves to boats or um, pier columns, and they just sit there. Studies have shown that they move at most an inch a year, and they sit there and they wait for things to come to them food, whatever. They just wait for it to come by to them. They don't go out looking or doing anything. So over time, because they're not looking for food, they don't need their eyes. So they start absorbing their eyes. They start absorbing their spine because they're hardly moving. And over time, the brain begins to atrophy and slowly absorbs into their, their body as well. So we don't want to be the sea squirt and we don't want to be um, Jack Nicholson from The Shining. That for kids, you know, they need play a lot. For us as adults, we can get busy. We're all, that happens to all of us. And we can put play outside so we can get so bogged down that we're not playing. And we can do that for a while and it's okay. But if we do it long term, when we finally get an opportunity to play or have a moment of joy, we, we can't feel it because we're so deprived and it's, it's like we've lost those muscles and we just can't feel happiness over an extended period of time because we, we've been deprived of it for so long. And I think that's really what the key to Brown's research with violent criminals kind of gets into. Okay, scavenger hunt. We have to break up the serious now. Do you have any tear drinkers? Oh, yes, Tammy. I was going to say there's a comment um, in the chat about TV watching. Uh -huh. and it's not research, but it makes sense to me that big oh. breaks, I have heard can be slower when watching TV than even sleeping. Wow. Not research, but boy, it makes sense to me. Yeah, it sure yeah. does. Carol, you have a question or you have a tea bag? I have a tea bag. Yay! <laughs> a fellow tea drinker. Do we have any other tea bags out there? Oh yeah, Becky and Tiffany, Lori. We got a lot of tea drinkers out there. Robin. Awesome. If we had time, I'd go into what kind of tea. So then, I've talked about the importance. Oh, Shakira, do you also have a tea bag, or you have a question? She said in chat she has tea. A tea. Mm -hmm. See, God, there's a lot of us. I had no idea. That's great. So what is play? Obviously, here it's the opposite of play is not work. Is depression, which we which kind of spoke to. The like official definitions, the one below is from Brown, but I put the one above because it's the scientific one. But if you look at it, really, if you stop using the big words in the scientific one, it's the same as Brown's definition, where play, when you look at it, seems to have no purpose. You're doing it just because. It's voluntary, no one's making you play. And you're doing so because there's something about it that drives you to it. You know, I have that with jigsaw puzzles. There's a jigsaw puzzle. I have to go find a piece in it. You know, as, as you get into it, you start losing track of time. You kind of stop paying attention to yourself, too. You're not, you're kind of outside of yourself into this game. 
It can have an improv improvisational potential, like you can just like adapt it and change it. You know, how many of us have board games where we all have our different family rules and you play the game with somebody else and you like adjust to those rules. So you're, imp you're improving. And we have a, the desire to just keep doing it, and continue doing it. That's play. Okay. I mentioned earlier that all, research has shown that we all have these different play personalities. So let's see if I can uh, do a new one share. More, one more thing in chat that's kind of relevant is George mm -hmm. said, Play is a group who comes together agreeing on the activities, rules, et cetera, the magic circle idea. Yeah. Awesome. Everybody get that quote from chat. Say that. Okay, so let's see what personalities we have here in play. Okay, a lot of us are explorers. And we got some competitors in here. So we can see. You know, what I find interesting is to see if as a profession, because we're drawn to this profession, if we have two different play personalities. And it looks like, at least with this group here, I don't have a scientific thing. I really should do this sometime with librarians. That we have like a couple dominant personality types going here that explore, which makes sense. We like to dig into research, right? And the competitor I think people often have a stereotype of librarians. Oops, here's a collector. Cool. That's adding to uh, that we're not that competitive. Well, we have our moments, right? But to think about now our communities. If we think about our communities and their personalities and who we see in our community and are we adapting and recognizing their play personalities as well. Okay, that's where we did it. So I wanted to present this idea and we don't have time to really get into it. That would be a fabulous discussion sometime. Is, you know, really think about it, our, our, our programming design. We often think about what our needs are and things like that. So think about too, your players in your community and recognizing that need to come up ways with addressing all those different personalities, just as we do the reading interests, their play personalities as well. And in doing so, that leads us to talking about types of play. There are seven you see here. The first is attunement. And attunement is what we've been doing with scavenger hunt. We now have a sense of who the tea drinkers are, who has the purple pen people, right? We're learning about each other. That help, helps us relate to each other. It helps us build relationships and maintain those over time. So that entombment play is really important. In children, it is peekaboo, right? They're attuning. Oh, someone's gone. Oh, they're there. Oh, they're gone. They're there. As adults, we have a little more sophisticated attunement needs. So it, that it's really about getting to know the other people and where they are and what's going on in our world. So things like the scavenger hunt to get to know your library so that it's attuning people to your library space, or you could even do it out in your community so they get to know your, your town. Um, but things like the human library events where you have volunteers with different lived life experiences act as human books and you have an event where your patrons come in and they can check out those human books for 30 minutes or so and have a conversation. They share their story um, in a conversation and they get to know each other and learn about a different aspect of someone's lived experience that they hadn't experienced. And it really attunes folks to each other and to the world. I think you, no one's surprised to see body and movement play, right? We have to move and we're thinking constantly when we're moving. So movement play is really important. We've seen a lot of research tying movement to like math skills and math learning, for instance. But we can do things like that in our library too. If you have the space, you could have miniature golf going on in your shelves and your stacks, I mean. 
Um, even building, if some of your books that have been donated that you're not going to add, you can make little you know, tunnels for things. But even things like story walks, like we do story walks for children. What about a story walk when the weather's great for adults? Uh, this is one with the North Olympic library system that they partnered with the park service and did story walks with poetry. So they were poetry walks. The idea of moving, but at the same time, they're engaging with the nature, they're engaging with the literature as well. And thinking, you know, there's questions and activities and things to think about along the way. And it can be as simple as ukulele strumming, body movement, going to that. And if we think about that, it also leads us to object play, where we are working with an object, and we're manipulating it, playing with it. This really helps with our problem solving skills. How do I fit this square thing in this round hole kind of thing? We're working with these objects and it's their problem solving and they're fiddling things, figuring things out. So things like Jenga is totally problem solving, right? And critical thinking. If I move this, what's going to happen? There's a lot of predicting going on. So that's those brain cells work in there. Or, you know, book spine poetry. There's a bunch of books organizing them around and trying to figure out what makes a good poem. Sorry for the blurry image. It was the best I could find, um, badly. But we're still manipulating and we're problem solving and we're working on that eye-hand coordination. Then there's imaginative play where, you know, obviously we pretend, right? And a lot of us talk about how it engages us, it, it makes us, I don't know, it frees us, it nourishes the spirit, spirit as it says on the screen, which I think is a lot of reading. Reading nourishes our experience and we're engaging in a lot of imaginative play while we're reading, again, because we're deciding things as we read. But it's also important for us to be innovative in our approaches. That stretching those muscles really helps us work on our own innovation. It helps us be empathy, be more empathetic with others because we can put ourselves more in other people's shoes. So things like those mystery dinners or mysteries within your shell stacks, um, those are great forms of imaginative play. Or even, uh, I just recently saw this, vision boards for book characters. Like if you had an all read, something like that, and people could just imagine, well, what would this character put on their vision board? What would they have? How would they move it around? What would they emphasize? You know, that's imagination. That's putting ourselves in someone else's shoes. And it helps us develop those empathy skills as well as be innovative in approaching things in our own lives. Hey, Melissa, there were just a couple uh -huh. of things in the chat. I'm oh, yeah, to... please. There were some conversations of what kind of tea they drink. So that's kind of cool. Um, and Robin said that they have story walks within their library at the Bellevue University. Great. And there's a comment, um, it's HQ ref. Uh -huh. um, physiologically, movement increases endorphins, which provide feelings of euphoria and well being. Movement is exercise for the brain, it has been said. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of great input. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. And I'm going to the T Smith to go get some of that wear. I do like wear tea. Yeah, but movement is so important. And actually that's, even though we've done movement and, and body play, social play is a big part of that, that relates to that. If we think with children and they're wrestling around or even kittens, right? Puppies, they learn to wrestle around with each other. That social play, that physical play has those endorphins going. And so they're developing positive associations with these other critters or in kids cases of their children, the animals are their critters. So you're, you know, you're developing those positive associations with people and, you know, not having negative associations with people, but through this play, we're also learning like what our boundaries are, like how far can I push that? What can I do? This is, this is kind of where you start learning the norms is in social play. What are our social norms and what's going on here? Um, there's been some interesting research with kittens and rats who, as when they were young, if they are, do not play, 
it really impacts their ability to socialize as adults and find a mate um, because they don't have that social play. They haven't learned those norms. And so it's difficult for them. So as adults, we may not necessarily always engage in wrestling with each other around, but there are other things we do in terms of social play. You know, spelling bees aren't just for kids. This was at, um, I think, British Columbia, as I recall. Or tea parties, those things that, you know, we think of kids, adults can do as well, tea parties. This um, Crown's Tea event in, in Norman, Oklahoma, is, is also partially a celebration of the culture around church hats in the African-American community and wearing your church hat on Sunday. And so they have a tea party where people come with their best tea hat, their best fancy hat. And if you don't have one, the library supplies you with one. And they have tea and they have music and they're socializing, they're interacting with each other and they're playing. Okay, storytelling and narrative play. Probably don't need to explain this one much, right? And it involves so many of those other previous types of play we've talked about, imagination, empathy, helping us understand and imagine what it's like to be someone else. You know, when we do oral histories and give people opportunities to tell their stories and be storytellers, that is play when we're recording those or if we're facilitating a play activity. Or if we're hosting a poetry slam and people are sharing their experience in the form of a poetry poem, excuse me, and a slam. You know, we can partner with different groups to do these slams and it's totally play and it's, it's storytelling, which kind of leads us to creative play, right? And creative play is really, you really get in and you just, you know, boundaries, borders, you can really go in there and forget about those really, not worry about, I need to have the sky blue. It can be purple, it can be green. You can just really be creative. And this is crucial for us, our ability to think in new ways, to be innovative when we start letting go of those things that shape us and we start reshaping them. And we can think about how many things in our life we probably wanna reshape. Well, we need creative play to help us keep those neural muscles alive to do that. So even when we have things as simple as self-directed activities in the library, like adult coloring, or this is those wooden tongue dispressors. So everyone can decorate their own and then they put it together in a, in a collaborative art piece in the community. Um, I always love for ideas for collaboration. Um, this is just those crafts when we do crafts in the library. We're allowing people the opportunity to create and express themselves. Although, you know, on the surface, these look very similar, but they've got very different noses there going on. So they're all viewing these robots in another way. We can also collaborate creatively in, in things like poetry. Like, do we have, a, everyone reads a book, and I'll read a book in our community. Have everyone pick their favorite line or their favorite word, and together they can combine and create a new poem around this work, they're called found poems. So there's all kinds of ways we can, things we can do in addition to having to create, you know, art projects and things like that, but also other ways to interact and create things together, individually or together. Okay, so I went through a whole bunch of those. Let's think about it again. I think I need to go move the slide. If you still have that up. So you can tell me about what types of play you've done in your library. Here we go. You should be able to choose more than one option. Oh, wow. Look at that variety. And in the chat, there was a comment um, about especially the book you highlighted by Stuart Brown. I think that was mm -hmm. a reference to an earlier slide. 
And then play, how it shapes the brain, opens the imagination, and invigor invigorates the soul. And then Dana said that we offer yeah. community yoga class weekly. Very cool. Yeah, very cool. Oh, yeah. And we have a kind of set. That's right. It's for the brain. Yeah. Ukulele clubs. Book club at a brewery. It, you know, I mean, look at what we're already doing. And so I'm not sure if, if my presentation is so much to um, encourage you to do more because we're already doing a lot. It's to help folks realize the importance of this that libraries are doing for their communities and what this means for them. So look at all this attunement and creativity, what we're doing for our community. Um, by having all these things available. Oops. Wrong button. But thank you all for that. Okay. Who has a sweet tooth? Okay, Jennifer. Elizabeth, Wendy, Carrie. Let's see, did I miss somebody? I think I did. Katie. Lots of hands raised too. Lots of hands raised. Robin. Uh, whoops. Yeah, so we have. A is it all left over from Halloween? That's what's at my house. I was gonna save it for Christmas and it's, it's not gonna make it that long. As part of this, I want to emphasize that it's not just our community play that we wanna think about and we wanna think about our play. You know, this helps us do our jobs as well. So are we playing? Uh, are we just providing opportunity for our communities to play? And where are we playing? Are we playing with our community? Because play can really help us build trust and develop relationships. And now, you know, there's a real reason a lot of deals are made at the golf course. I'm not saying we all have to play golf. These fabulous librarians are pig wrestling in Wyoming, right? So they're out there, they're, you know, someone is going to be you know, more trusting of them because they're willing to go out and cover themselves in mud and play, play and wrestle with a pig. Someone will be more relaxed and willing to interact with them because they've seen this experience and they've built relationships through this play in their communities. So if we tie it all together, we have a sense hopefully of why play is important. We know we need to be aware of our different players in our community and who they are. Keep an eye out for those players and how that can, you know, influence or help you shape, shape your play. But you're already doing so much in play and libraries already are doing so much in play. It was great last spring. I gave a presentation with people who were non-library folks to say, hey, who do play research and say, hey, you know, there's an opportunity for your research here because it's happening and it's very dynamic for adults. Sometimes we run into colleagues, shareholders in our communities who think that, who don't value. They have a very definite mindset on what libraries should be or should look like. And I hope that when I talked about the benefits of play and the things that it adds, all of those, that creativity, that intelligent, innovative, relationships, exploration, those are things that are often in our library missions. If we think about our library missions and what they are, many of those words and term, the terminology that we use to talk about play are in our missions. And so we can use those to say, hey, you know, this is important. We do this because this is important and it benefits our community because research shows again and again that groups that play together form relationships and skills and 
when things get tough, they are more resilient together and they can achieve more and negotiate things because they've played together and they've laid a foundation with that. Okay, not done with the scavenger hunt. Do we have any paperweights out there? I'm kind of looking to be stumped folks. Three folks have paperweights. Carrie again. Yeah, not many paperweights out there. A few right. raised hands. A few raised hands. Yeah, I was just Jennifer thinking. Jennifer says everything on her desk is a paperweight. That's <laughs> kind of my life. <laughs> So here's my references beyond those two I shared earlier. There, I have quite a few. And I wanted to kind of talk rather rapidly or whatever to make sure we had time for discussion and questions if anybody has any or ideas of, that they've done for play in their communities that they think is just amazing. And now you realize how amazing they are. And all ages game nights. Robin had to find her paperweight under her papers. Now I might be preaching to the choir because it's with librarians, but like when we're doing our summer reading workshop in January, I have a breakout box clues all planned for the librarians to do kind of as a, as a test run. But like Brian, right. they already get it how fun it is to play and the importance. Right. Let's see, we have a chess club for kids and adults and music jam session the first day. Oh, how awesome is that? Yeah, and having music in the library. Live at the library, monthly music sessions, card making, magazines, craft sessions, junk journals. Afternoons, trivia nights, International Games Week. Oh, great. The link to, I don't know if people are seeing in the chat, the link to the ALA games. Bridge, instant, instant Shakespeare. I haven't heard of that. Virtual Je Jeopardy. Cocoa bombs. You're going to be popular. Activity bags. Yeah, that activity bags are, are a good sign of example of play where, you know, so much learning is attached to them as well. Books and beers. Yeah. Oh, mystery nights. Oh, this is nice. Mystery and nice have to a mix of activities, right? The physical, the puzzles, moving around. So you need to have a mix of that. Somebody likes wants to do a spelling bee, acting workshop, but moms played too. Maybe you need to do an adult one too. Escape room, memory kits. Oh yeah. Fascinating. So just in a few minutes. Look at all the ideas. How many people now just looking at these chats have now going, oh, I'm going to try that. Oh, I want to see what that is. And a craft book. Escape room for the staff. I think that's cool because librarians are so much behind the scenes planning this stuff. For them to actually do it is cool. Right. An interactive movie night. Right, the rat book is a piece of play. Oh yeah, I'm at wondering, I was wondering that too. How is the interactive movie night interactive? Jennifer, or Jennifer's probably now madly typing. 
and the library hosted trivia, whether you do it on Zoom or in your library or the right librarian walked into the bar. I, and I got to be honest, I was I was I was trying to it's, decide it's between a, the, it's a script. It's actually it's script? based on a script. Yeah. So there's different things that they do depending on what part of the movie they are. So um, it's going to involve a lot of candy. I uh, so when you asked about the candy, I'm I'm sitting on about several pounds of candy behind me. Um, but they'll eat, they'll be doing candy. Um, there's prompts where they actually like they'll be yelling things. Um, there's actually a part where they're throwing like we have to provide some like s snowballs and they because it's the, we're doing a Christmas story, so oh. they're gonna be like throwing they're gonna throw snowballs. They're gonna make like noises. So it, it's an, it's very interactive. It, it lives up to its name. Um, but the biggest thing is there's a lot of candy. I did not realize how much candy I was going to need to provide until I did the calculations and it's a lot of candy. Okay. Oh, someone did a Hocus Pocus one too. So it's kind of like the old um, Rocky Horror Picture Show interaction where you like throw toast at the screen and yeah, stuff like and that. Yeah, it's, and it's expanding to other movies so that I, I recall the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but I've seen it now with several different types of movies. So we wanted to do the holiday one because this is actually going to be for not just adults, but it's going to be for all ages. So we're really looking forward to kind of seeing the turnout that we get. Oh, right. I hope you have God's space. Rocky Horror. Yeah, so now how many people are going, ooh, 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 on so many of these things? Absolutely. And I'll send the chat text out when I send everything so that you can have, you don't have to scramble to write all these great ideas. I'll send a printout of it. That's great. That's great. I was, I was just wishing I had done a Mentimeter, but I think this is better because it's, it's hard to, to export that. So this is great. But yeah, I, I was starting to say I had a real trouble trying to decide between the scavenger hunt and the trivia, because I have a trivia one too, and I was going to do the trivia. And I went with the scavenger hunt because I thought, well, this explains attunement. Because if you heard how many, you know, people got into it and they're sharing, and now we have an idea of, oh, who, hey, there's another, you know, person who likes pour tea or, you know, these different things. Ah, we learn about each other and get to know each other better through that. And yes, they can be incorporated into the staff meetings as well. I would encourage doing something like that. Uh, like I used to always think those, those team building things were goofy, but as I look back on them in hindsight, they were so important. Um, when we were working on big projects and things came, came down to that, a lot of things were established beforehand. When we got to do that. Painting tutorial. A nailed it type of program. I'm writing all these down too. I should, I don't know why I'm doing it because Tammy's going to email it to us. Yep, I'll send you the text. Yeah. But yeah, so many great ideas. Thank you all. This is great. There's a new one. It's like Christmas. There's a new message. Yeah, what is a nailed it program? Thank you for asking that. So Nailed It was a TV show that was on Netflix and it's basically a, well, it's a bake show and they have these amateur bakers. They have no, not really, they are amateur and they are, they get these challenges to cre recreate a design and the results are hilarious um, because again, these are amateur bakers. So it, they're, half the battle is just making the actual cake. Um, but then it's, you know, creating the design. So you just kind of see the goofs and, and, and it is, it's hilarious just because, you know, everyone just tries to make what they think is, is the design and the design, mind you, is obviously done by professional. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get to see their designs in comparison to the original design. And it, it's kind of funny. Um, and apparently whoever wins like gets money. So it's kind of a, a fun trade-off. Oh, cool. That reminds me, someone had an Instapot um, post earlier, 
about Instapod and cooking, you know, those things like that, we don't necessarily always think about as play, but for a lot of us, that is play. And it made me think of, I can't remember which library does this, but I think a couple libraries do this where it's book food. And so you come up with cakes or meals for books, associated with books. So like you create a decorated cake that you know, represents the book or a meal that appeared in the book and people recreate it and post them on Instagram as part of their, their you know, interactive part of it, but then they're playing. We're doing something similar to that um, in December. Uh, it's for like a holiday program. So we've actually got a couple, uh, couple of things done, but we're doing one where it's gonna be tea tasting. But what we're doing is we're reading excerpts from books that feature that particular tea. So uh, we're teaming up with a local tea business who, um, and we are, we're, we're highlighting like a Ceylon, a Pura, uh, or a Pura, um, a Rooibos, and then we're going into the books and we're finding the excerpts that highlight this particular tea. And so uh -huh. that I think is kind of inspiring that play, the imaginative play, because we're hoping that, you know, as they're drinking the tea and they're hearing the story, that it kind of allows them to embed themselves into the story a little bit. Right. And we all know if we have food, people come, right? I was just thinking you could also probably do so much with chocolate. And we just, you know, think how popular chili competitions are <laughs> like that, how much we could build on that and interact and in how much of that food is in our literature, food literature and foodie literature, you know, chocolate for Valentine's Day. Yeah. Yes, food is a power tool. Oh, this is awesome. Thank you. That's kind of what all I had was just to hopefully point out how meaningful what everyone is doing is and put it into a larger context of this is significant work. You know, this play things we do for our adults is, is serious and it's very important work. And often it's easy to forget that because we get bogged down in what we think the library should be. And we're here to enrich lives and souls and play is one way we do that so much. So thank you, everyone. Yeah, I think you really highlighted the importance. People think of it for kids and for story time, but adults kind of get forgotten with that. Right. And, and, and I know sometimes people, you know, we, we can run into walls of people not wanting, thinking what with that is important or we shouldn't be doing this. And so hopefully you've got a little ammunition say, no, yeah, no, this matters. This really does. So yes, thank you everyone for your participation. Yeah, so many great ideas. So exciting. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of great thank yous and um, so many ideas to bring into the library. And yes, I love that you have the information to back it up that it's important it's not just uh it's not just doing it for fun it's doing it because it is serious so, yeah lots of great thank yous excellent well thank no thank all of you you know you do you do something like a scavenger hunt and you want to make, you don't know if it, people will play so <laughs> i appreciate that a lot of playing yeah very interesting well thank you so much Thank you.